right before we got on the air, I got to confirm more about this. I read it very, very quickly. USCIS came out with a new memo. The Department of Homeland Security came out with a new memo requiring COVID tests for every person who is going to be entering the United States as of October 1st. You need a negative COVID test, whether U.S. citizen, resident, non-immigrant visa holder, you have to take that COVID test within 72 hours of getting on an airplane or prove that you will have recovered from COVID in the last six months. In addition, as of October 1st, any person who will be applying for a green card, whether you get sponsored by your spouse or a family member, you got sponsored in a job, you've applied for asylum, whether you're adjusting your status in the United States or you are getting a green card, an immigrant visa appointment at the U.S. Embassy in another country. Part of the requirement now is to prove that you are fully vaccinated for COVID as of October 1st. That just literally happened within the last hour or so of us coming on the air. It's a result of the CDC, the FDA, uh, proving the Pfizer vaccine saying that it is no longer emergency uh, uh, authorized, but it is now authorized for general use as safe and effective. And once that happened, the US military is now requiring vaccinations of everybody. Department of Homeland Security requiring every person obtaining a green card as of October 1st moving forward as part of the medical exam that you have to submit to uh, immigration, whether it's at the U.S. Embassy for an immigrant visa, whether it's adjustment of status, your requirement to have a COVID fully, fully COVID vaccine, both shots. So does this mean that you would get the vaccine in the United States or in their own country? Either. Oh, either? Either. Because you I have know, to show like that this, you're vaccinated. Right. Because I know, in, well, at least in Africa, some parts of Africa very is very difficult. difficult. My, my friend, her, her grandmother just passed and she was actually trying to come here yeah. to try and get a vaccine. I don't know what they're going to do in certain parts of the world. Yikes. I honestly don't know. This just happened within the last hour or so. Wow. So I just got to A, confirm it all. I just saw a news post. I didn't read anything directly from the Department of Homeland Security. I actually saw a news post. So I got to confirm it and we'll confirm it uh, uh, and on our next show. Mm. But uh, and I don't know what they would do in certain parts of the world where vaccines are limited. Mm -hmm. So who knows what what would happen there? So since we're on the subject, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not going to take away from the social media check in, but right. we're on the subject. Uh, uh, is this Keisha Mi Cisa Mitchell? Cisha Mitchell. C okay, Cisha, uh, yeah. Cisha Mitchell saying, so does that mean people who already have an application and will have to be vaccinated? Does that mean? Uh, I believe what that means is if you don't have a green card as of October 1st. Uh, so even if your application you That's how I read the news article. Mm -hmm. Again, I, gotta, I have not read the fine print yet, I have to be honest with you. Because um, it just happened. It just happened. Yeah. But from what I understand, from what I read, it appears that if you don't have a green card as of October 1st, they are going to require you to be vaccinated to get the green card. Awesome. So for a lot of the anti-vaxxers out there, a lot of people who don't like to put anything in their body, it's going to be a very, very, very tough choice. Yeah. You know, but it's going to be that for everything. You know, for example, you know, today in New York, Governor Cuomo, he... He left office. We're gonna we're gonna kind of swing around a little bit, Julian. Uh, Governor Cuomo he left office, mm -hmm. and he was replaced by Kathy Hochul. Almost sounds like how cool, but Hochul. Hochul. Hochul, not how cool. And she was sworn in as the first female governor. And part of her swearing-in speech, she said, "Boy, boy." She said, <laughs> she, "She said by the seashore." She, sure. <laughs> she said. <laughs> She said that as part of her uh, acceptance speech to become the governor of the state of New York, that her first thing that she's going to do is require the New York State Department of Health to mandate that every person, every adult who works in any school in the state of New York, whether public or private, be vaccinated. Wow. That is her, one of her first things that she will be doing as governor. And that comes on the heels of uh, Mayor de Blasio saying that city school, every adult in the city school, public school system mm -hmm. needs to be vaccinated. That comes on the heels of 
United Airlines requiring it. Mm -hmm. That comes on the heels of the U.S. military requiring it. United Airlines is requiring it of all their employees. Right. That comes on the heel of uh, the biggest uh, health provider in, in, in New York, um, Northwell, requiring it of all of their employees as well. There was a walkout in one of their Northwell Staten Island hospitals as a result of that. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to happen everywhere. It's not a situation where there is going to be, you know, um, you know, people trying to, you know, manipulate you into a vaccination. What it's going to be, it's, it's going to be mandated. It's going to be mandated to live your life, to get a green card, to be in the military, to work in certain hospitals and corporations to walk into restaurants. Ultimately, I'm sure that's what's going to happen too. Mm -hmm. So part of life in America, at least, I don't know about the rest of the world, but part of life in America is going to be, it's going to be hard to get around mandates of vaccinations now that the CDC and the FDA has come out and said that the Pfizer vaccine is authorized. I assume in the next few weeks, we're going to hear that Moderna is also authorized and safe. And I assume even a couple of weeks after that, we're going to hear Johnson and Johnson. What are you looking up in the air? Because the scene of the air is on. Oh, okay. I thought you were praying to God for a second. Uh, all of a sudden, well, I'm, 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 I'm talking about there. mandates and vaccines, and Yo Yo's like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I, thought, I thought you were praying to God. Well, Car so, Carol, Carol Anderson, the Tiger, said, I agree with her. Absolutely. They should get vaccinated right. and at business places should as well. So Yeah. Now, according to a study published today by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, vaccine effectiveness against COVID infection dropped from 91% to 66% uh, once the Delta variant was accounted for. So you go on the original, on the original, on the original um, COVID, mm -hmm. the one that came from, <laughs> from Wuhan, right. wherever, whether mm -hmm. it came from the wet market or lab or wherever it came from, mm -hmm. the original COVID, the vaccine was 91% effective with the Delta variant, which mutated, <clears throat> it's 66% effective. But, but despite that, despite that, almost it is extraordinarily effective in preventing disease that would require you to be hospitalized or even possibly die so even though you may get covid most likely if you are vaccinated to an extraordinarily high level of probability it will be a bad cold it will not be a deadly disease for you uh about 51 and a half percent of the population is currently vaccinated. Dr. Fauci, some people believe him, some people don't. Uh, he says that in order for America to get back to quote unquote normal, we're gonna need to have an overwhelming majority of people vaccinated by spring of 2022. Mm -hmm. What is an overwhelming majority? He didn't say the percentage. I would put it at 90%. Oof. I would put it at 90%. I mean, with all these new rules coming out, yeah. they might get there by spring. I, I don't know. Maybe. Um, you know, right now, COVID is not under control. Uh, there's 147,000 new cases a day in the United States hospitals. In Kentucky, multiple National Guard teams are being deployed to hospitals across the state, dealing with the rise of COVID-19 cases and hospital staffing shortages. Um, even even here in New Jersey, I'm just reading, Governor Phil Murphy announced a vaccine mandate Monday. All state employees, which includes pre-K through 12 schools and public universities, are all required to be vaccinated in New Jersey by October 18th. I'm just saying, you know, if they, I, if they had done this a little earlier because there's so many festivals going on, I actually was supposed to interview celebrities at one in Jersey at MetLife right. on Sunday, and I did not go because the Delta variant is out there. You so you know? didn't go because of the Delta yeah. variant? Was it canceled or you chose no, not I to chose go? No, I chose not to. Really? Yeah. It's like hundreds of thousands of people. Okay. <laughs> it's scary, now, actually. Now, uh, now, I'm actually, I'm proud of you. At yeah. the same time, surprised. I thought you would have went no, anyway. No, no. Uh, and everybody <clears throat> was there. Cardi B, everybody. 
was there. Lil right. Kim. Oh. Yeah, but you want to know what? You know, my Cla- life is. But, but you want to know what? More. Cardi B, Lil Kim, they're they're human too. Yeah. You know, they're just as likely to get it as anybody else. Yeah. There. Yeah. You know, but if they're vaccinated, they're not likely to be sick. But I'm sure there were not a lot. I mean, I'm sure that there was a big amount of people that attended that concert that's not vaccinated. All right. Well, so. the, the other big news, the other big news is Afghanistan. Um, Joe Biden is sticking with his decision for the United States to pull out by August 31st. He made the decision mindful of the security risks of remaining in the country longer. Even as the United States flies out tens of thousands of people out of the country each day, the situation in Afghanistan is pretty desperate. Now, the crisis uh, required talks between Biden and the G7 leaders from the seven largest economies in the world. They all came together on a video conference today about the evacuations from Afghanistan. The White House, uh, the G7 leaders requested Biden to stay in Afghanistan longer. He said, no, the U.S. is picking up and leaving. The White House did say yesterday that 12,700 people were evacuated by 37 U.S. military flights. 8,900 were evacuated by coalition flights in the last 24 hours. That means almost 20,000 people they got out of Afghanistan in the last 24 hours. Uh, 58,700 people have evacuated from Afghanistan since August 14th. Um, The American military is in control of the Kabul International Airport. They are in control of its airspace. They are in control of air traffic control, even though the Taliban controls everything else. Now, representatives of the Taliban have called the August 31st deadline firm. They said that the United States remaining in Afghanistan after August 31st would be a violation of the treaty that they originally signed with Donald Trump. Now, CIA Director Bill Burns, he traveled to Afghanistan this week to meet with Taliban leaders, according to officials who said that the United States is seeking a clear understanding of where the Taliban stands on many different issues. Now, the Taliban is saying that they do not want any any Afghans to go to the airport, that Afghans are absolutely safe in Afghanistan, that bellies the news reports of, uh, of Taliban fighters who are targeting uh, people and their families who assisted the United States. They're also targeting uh, women who have uh, taken positions uh, both uh, uh, in the community and women who have flouted their very conservative Islamic values. Uh, So we'll see what happens there. Um, You know, a lot of questions we don't have answers to in Afghanistan. Right. I get a lot of questions every day. How do you get out of Afghanistan? It's humanitarian parole, military parole, get to a third country and apply for refugee status. Even if you apply for that humanitarian parole or military parole, who knows how long it will take to get approved if it ever does get approved. And then how do you still get out of the country once you have these papers? That's a whole other story. How do you get to the airport? That's a whole other story. Right. You know, know, if if you're really, you know, the the best solution is just figure out a way to get out. You know, you don't have as a lawyer, I don't, you know, I, you know, unfortunately, I can't parachute into Afghanistan and you know take somebody out on, on a private airplane. Right. I don't have a private airplane. I don't know how to parachute. And I'm certainly not qualified to go into a, a military zone in Afghanistan. So for me to tell people how to get out, I have no idea. Yeah. Unfortunately. And I get those. It's sad because I wish I could help, but I don't have the answers. Right. Meanwhile, people are asking, well, what is the United States doing to vet the people who are coming out of Afghanistan. How do we know they are good people and not bad people? Well, there is such a thing as the Afghan Special Immigrant Visa Program. It's existed since 2009. It's meant to provide a pathway to the United States for Afghans who are employed by or worked on behalf of the U.S. military. Now, there's a lengthy, multi-step process for the Special Immigrant Visa applicants to apply for visas to the United States. They have to have met certain employment qualifications for the U.S. government or U.S. military, provide supporting documents 
of what they did to assist the U.S. military and the United States government, including proof of their employment, a letter of recommendation from their United States superior, and evidence of their Afghan nationality. After that, they go through an entire biometrics process and security clearance. Biometrics includes voice prints, scans of your eyes, palm prints, facial photos, all of those special immigrant visas, applicants who have received instructions to come to the airport have already completed certain stages of that vetting process already. Bring out the tea! <laughs> so, does, does anybody watch Jeopardy here? Are you a Jeopardy watcher? Uh, no, I used to when I was younger. I, I, I was more of a Wheel of Fortune guy. You, you love, who, you love Pat Sajak? Yes, and Vanna White. And Vanna White? Yeah. You ever watch Jeopardy? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, but I agree. Uh, Wheel of Fortune was way more fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, there are a lot of Jeopardy fans out there. Yeah. And you know, Alex Trebek, um, he passed away, and there so was a, and there was a big you know to do about replacing him. Right. And the executive producer Mike Richards, he he had he brought in all these guest hosts, and uh, he tried out God knows how many people, and at the end he said. Mm, you know what? He, I'll be my own. He, you know what he did? Wait, he's the EP? Yes, he was the executive producer. So you know what he did, Vanessa? You know what he did? What? He, he, other than I have nothing to do with this guy, other than me and him have one thing in common. I was the executive producer of this show, and I looked around for all the different hosts to do it, and then I said, you know what? I'm going to do it myself. Why not? I got, I got this. So he did the same thing, except I didn't test anyone out. I just went and did it. Uh, he did this. He did the same exact thing I'm after not testing that. out. He did. He, you know, he had Levar Burton. That's and, why I'm mad because right. I feel like Levar Burton should have got it. There are so many people signing petitions for him, and yeah. he actually wanted that gig. And, so, and you know, I, 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 you know, Levar Burton. You know, he was he became famous from being Kunta Kinte in Roots. Right, and then in the off, Reading Rainbow, I grew up right. with watching Reading Rainbow. Right. He's all about education. Right. <laughs> so, any event Try after going after, go Try after going Try through after going through trifling. What was it? Trifling. Try yes, Vanessa, trifling. So, after going through all of these hosts, he says, hmm, "You know what? You've got to be kidding me. I'm going to make myself the producer." No, the I'm gonna host. make myself the host. I'm the producer. I'm gonna make myself Please. the host too. And ain't nobody asked so, him to do that. So apparently, he was a stand-up comedian, a failed stand-up comedian, who then went on to be an executive producer at The Price Is Right, and then eventually become the executive producer at Jeopardy. However, however, um, Sony executive said the ultimate decision for being the host was not his, and. Um, and then he and then he stepped aside from the process once he became a candidate. Yeah, right. I don't buy it. I think the I think the uh, the, the you know the, there was like some sort of back backdoor right. dealing. Absolutely. But be that as it may, be that as it may, he was a failed comedian, and he always wanted to be in front of the camera, but he was always behind the camera. He did a podcast, and on his podcast, I guess trying to be like a funny guy. Oh my God. All he did was insult everybody in racist, anti-Semitic, misogynist wow. uh, comments against blacks, Jews, and women. <laughs> wow, great candidate. Great candidate. Great. great candidate to be to be the host of Jeopardy. So once, okay. once all of his anti-Semitic and racist and misogynistic um, comments came out. He said, "Up, oh, you found me out. I can't be the host of Jeopardy anymore." No. So he, oh. yeah. So he stepped aside, and now there is no host of Jeopardy other than uh, Miriam, uh, Mayam. What's your last name? Bialik. Who Mayam Bialik? She was on. Is that Blossom? Yes. Yeah, uh, and then she was on Big Bang Theory. She was on Big Bang Theory. Yeah, exactly. Blossom. You yeah. remember? That's yeah. when she was a kid. Blossom. Yeah, she was Blossom, and now she was on wow. Big Bang Theory. So she is going to be. She has been. She's going to host this week. She's also going to host the Prime Time 
We don't know if she's going to get Give the, it to be the, host, the host of everything. Give it to LeVar Burton. But now I have to say after... Look at him. He's what, right in the middle. What a bad look, by the way, for Jeopardy yeah, now. That's if true. after they hire... After they hire this white dude who turned out to be a racist, anti-Semitic, mm -mm. misogynist, mm -mm. that they then go and hire another white dude, mm -mm. it's going to be a bad look for Jeopardy, right? Mm -mm. Right? They have, they have to have... You had people from all walks of life that wanted LeVar Burden to be it. Like, he literally raised a whole generation with Reading Rainbow. And he wants to do it. He's the perfect candidate. Would, like, would, you, would you be okay if Blossom and LeVar Burden... A combination. A, a combination, sure. Yeah. In yeah, other words, because they want, they want Blossom, gotta, they want uh, Miriam. I, I, I know, we keep on calling her Blossom. Call her Blossom uh, <laughs> to, to be the prime time. Am, yeah. And uh, and then they yeah, need to switch it up. Up. Maya Bialik. That. Yeah, you have a woman and then you have a black man. Yeah. There you go. There you Diversity got it. at its finest. Inclusivity at its finest. There you go. Yeah. That is trifling. Trifling, right? Out of 16 people, like big time people that they put yeah. on there, they going to pick him? They picked a nobody host. They picked a nobody executive producer. Is, and they said it wasn't like up. In, as much as I have to be in this industry because like I have true love for it, I hate this industry because of stuff like that. It's so unfair. You know, when I read this stuff, I like I want to pour like yeah. vodka into yeah. this thing. Meanwhile, there was like a curb your enthusiasm situation in, in Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. <laughs> you ever watch Curb Your Enthusiasm? Mm -mm. It's a funny mm -mm. show. It's a very funny show. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. Larry David on Curb Your Enthusiasm, if you've ever watched Seinfeld. Yes. Okay. So the character George on Seinfeld oh, yeah. is modeled after Larry David. And then when Seinfeld went off the air... Uh, Larry David did uh, a new show. Basically, he's George, but now successful George instead of loser George. That's basically the difference. And and the show is 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 not is scripted, but it's also they talk off the cuff as well. So nevertheless, he is he is a staunch liberal, Larry David, and he bumped into Alan Dershowitz, who is the famous constitutional lawyer from Harvard who was representing Donald Trump in his impeachment. And uh, Alan Dershowitz walked over to Larry David in the food store in Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. He said, we can still talk, Larry. And then Larry David replied, no, no, we really can't. I saw you, I saw you with your arm around Mike Pompeo. It's disgusting. Dershowitz replied, he's my former student. I greet all my former students that way. I can greet my, I can't greet my former students. Larry David replied, it's disgusting. Your whole enclave, it's disgusting. You're disgusting. And then Larry David walked away and refused to talk to the lawyer of Alan, uh, Alan Dershowitz because he was representing Donald Trump. Oh. All right. So now it's become a situation. These guys used to be friends <laughs> and now they hate each other. <laughs> All right. Do you have, have you seen, maybe, have you seen situations where families and friendships have been torn apart because of politics? Um, I've heard of friends, see, I, at least in my family, you know, we're all pretty much the same, right? right you right. know, um, but then I've heard other friends um, and associates where their family have a big difference and, you know, arguments happen at the table because of politics. Right. Have you have you seen, Vanessa, anything with your friends or family where politics has gotten involved and broken up friendships? Um, I don't think that they've fully broken up friendships, but I think it's kind of like, I, I might lean to not invite <laughs> so-and-so next time. Mm -hmm. Like, just- Has that happened? Has that happened where like somebody was like, like a like well, like a pro MAGA Trump person, and then you're like, I don't want to hang out with them anymore. I feel like I feel like I have to say, um, especially around the election, there's kind of like that energy around. But then, like once it passes, people kind of forget what people's like political views are, and then you're like, okay, and then it'll be like you're at an event, and you're like at an event, and it's like, oh yeah, that's right, they're they're a Trump supporter. It happened to me at a uh, at a comedy show. I was with a friend, and like I really enjoy this friend, like getting to know her. Someone here in Miami, of course. Long story short, we've hung out a few times. We go to a comedy show, and there's like a Trump 
joke made. And, you know, she was one of those people that was like, I love Trump. And I was like, ooh. 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 You know, I would have been like, you what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I want you to know, I haven't ended a friendship over it, but I have either muted or literally unfollowed people who were posting too much Trump crap, uh, especially yeah. during the election. You know, yeah. I, I would accept at least, all right, I saw one, fine. You, you said what your position is. I, I closed my eyes to it. I don't like it. But if somebody who was posting Trump, 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 I said, all right, you're gone, goodbye. Yeah. I couldn't handle it anymore. I don't need to be your friend. I don't follow you anymore. So I've unfollowed a lot of people who are like very pro-Trump, you know, um, and posting like Trump's MAGA stuff. It was annoying me. Yeah. Have you done that? I uh, definitely. Yes. Uh, yeah. Facebook. Uh, Meanwhile, sure. Alan Dershowitz, the uh, this was by the way a spy. This was in the New York Post. A spy said this like little thing happened mm -hmm. ah. between Dershowitz and Larry David. Uh, and when the Post followed up with him, uh, Larry uh, Dershowitz, he said, "I'll still be friends with Larry David. He just doesn't want to talk to me." <laughs> I wouldn't want to talk to him either. Yeah. Meanwhile, Beyonce has made fashion history as the first black woman to wear the iconic 128 and a half carat Tiffany diamond. Can we get a, can we get like a close up on that? 128 carat Tiffany diamond. It is the unearthed in South Africa in 1877. It has been worn by uh, people like Mary Whitehouse, the wife of American diplomat Edwin Sheldon Whitehouse. It has been worn by Audrey Hepburn, the famous Hollywood uh, starlet from Breakfast at Tiffany's. It's been worn by Lady Gaga. And now it is being worn for the first time by a black woman ever, uh, even though it came from Africa. Uh, <laughs> quite, that's, quite, yeah. quite, 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 quite uh, ironic, I, right? I'm, I'm um, a, a... <laughs> uh, and it is 128 carats. Um, it is in, uh, it's featured in an advertising campaign for Tiffany's. Now, part of the campaign, you see there's a uh, Basquiat. Basquiat. That's an unseen, right? Yes, that was the first time, Basquiat painting in the back. For those who don't know, uh, Jean Maquel Basquiat, he was an uh, extraordinarily famous uh, pop artist from the 1980s. He died at a very, very young, early age. I think it was either drug overdose or HIV, drug. but I, I think, think it was, it was, but I think it was a drug overdose. Uh, he was best friends with Andy Warhol. Warhol. People know who Andy Warhol is. Andy Warhol and Jean Michel Basquiat, they basically lived together, did their art together, traveled together, um, party together at mm -hmm. Studio 54 and whatever those iconic uh, discos from the 1980s. Um, and his art goes for, uh, and his, his artwork goes for 30, 40, 50, 60 million priceless, priceless art. And he ain't never got to see Be that. And he never saw any money from that because Please. he died. He died not as a, he became successful after his death. I hate um, stuff like and, that. And also, by the way, his art goes for that much because he didn't make a lot of it. Right. So because he died at such a young age, his artwork goes for a lot more money than Andy Warhol <laughs> because Andy Warhol made, made like so 18,000 yeah. works of art over his career. I don't right. know how much Basquiat made, but it's not nowhere near 18,000 works of art. Nevertheless, all of Basquiat's work is is a statement on the commercialization uh, of art and the commercialization of products and was basically anti-capitalist. And uh, there's a lot of backlash that Jay-Z and Beyonce are using an artist's work who was basically an anti-capitalist and against uh, product uh, and um, and advertising and all of this, you know, commercialization for the purpose of making a commercial for Tiffany's. Also quite ironic. A lot of irony in this in this um, advertising campaign, Vanessa. Yeah. Yes. Blood diamond. That's all Blood I got to say. Are y'all going to give that diamond back to Africa? <laughs> I, I just... I mean, you know, big up for sure, big ups to them for that. But um, 
me as a black man, uh, I don't think that it's you know a win for the black race just because Beyonce is the first black woman to wear that diamond. But now this is what Tiffany's has to say. I'll tell you what, Tiffany's has a different take on it, yo-yo. <laughs> I wonder All why. Right. <laughs> Tiffany's, <laughs> Tiffany's take on this is this. Beyonce and Jay-Z are the epitome of modern love story. As a brand that has always stood for love, strength, and self-expression, we could not think of a more iconic couple that better represents <laughs> Tiffany's values. We are honored to have the Carters as part of the Tip <laughs> Tiffany family and as part of their global advertising launch on behalf of Tiffany's. Uh, Beyonce will be releasing uh, a song called About Love, and it, uh, it is, uh, I'm sorry, it is About Love, and she's releasing a song called Moon River, which is the famous song from the 1961 movie. It's a remake of the fam famous song from the 1961 movie Breakfast at Tiffany's. I don't know what that song is. I, I don't either. Do you know what that song is? We'll find out soon once it's released. Yes. Moon River. Moon, Moon River. Is that it? I don't know. <laughs> I was just going to get off of you. <laughs> I don't know. Moon River. Moon River. Moon We're going to hear River. it. I have no We're, idea. We'll, we'll hear it soon. I mean, we'll hear it soon, though. <laughs> Do you know what it is? No, I don't. Let's leave it to the professionals. <laughs> you don't want me to sing. That's... I mean, you can't do what you want. I, I, I mean, after all, I am the executive producer and made myself the host. <laughs> <laughs> so I can do whatever you I want. You deserve to be the host. <laughs> <laughs>